Hi, I'm Sharon Ross with Capital City Arts Initiative. I'm here to introduce you to another Nevada Neighbors talk in our series. And this one is with Heather and Michael Llewellyn of Grass Valley, California. And their project is called Forest Fire. It is a major exhibition of the intricacies between keeping a healthy forest and the fires that sometimes arrive. Um, so we are going to have them give us a tour of the exhibition that was up at Truckee Community Recreation Center um, earlier. The show is now down, but we have a wonderful recording of it. So Heather and Michael, welcome. As is well documented in the press, the forests, watersheds, and communities of California are under serious threat from catastrophic fire and climate change. Solutions, supported by state policy, are underway to meet this threat, but no amount of policy is successful without the understanding and support of the people. Forest Fire was created as a public engagement project to support forest restoration in the mixed conifer forests of the Sierra Nevada by inspiring a cultural shift in our perception of, our relationship with, and most importantly, our responsibility to the forest biome that we depend upon for well-being. The Forest Fire Project has three components to engage the community, exhibit, education, and leadership. Project Narrative is established in the exhibit and is the foundation for educational programming and leadership inspiration. The narrative takes us on a journey that explains the causes and consequences of catastrophic fire and how it can be prevented by supporting forest restoration and forest resiliency. In this first chapter, What the Forest Was, the trees are mostly very large and far apart. Historical documents tell us that the Sierra Nevada old growth forest density was patchy with some areas of open meadow and some nursery areas where young trees grew up competing for sunlight and nutrients. But generally, the forest was dominated by large trees, up to seven feet in diameter, set far enough apart from one another that their branches did not touch. These large trees, through their thick bark and open canopy, were fire tolerant and shade intolerant. The forest floor was open and park-like with between five and 27 trees per acre on average. Settlers were able to drive their wagons very easily through the old growth forest, unimaginable in the dense forests of today. In addition, an open canopy allowing plenty of sun through meant an understory of diverse grasses, shrubs, insects, birds, and so on. The Sierra Nevada old growth forest was a complete ecology, a healthy forest. To represent this relationship, artist Cedra Wood gathered Jeffrey pine cones, separated the scales, drilled two holes into each, and sewed them all together into a cloak. She wanted to create an anthropomorphic shape to symbolically represent the relationship between herself and the natural world she had discovered during a winter residency at UC Berkeley's Sage and Creek Field Station. Kin-centric relationships acknowledge that the interdependency between kin is at the heart of well-being for all. They sometimes manifest in the seven-generation principle of sustainable land management. Essentially, land stewardship decisions by each individual ensures abundance for future generations, as past generations once did for the present. Up until 170 years ago, the old growth forest of the Sierra Nevada was cared for from a kin-centric perspective, devoted to abundance for all kin. For the tribes of the Sierra Nevada, fire was the principal tool used to encourage abundance. In the Tahoe Truckee region, Washoe people learned what lightning taught. Witnessing the abundance that sprang up in the path of lightning strike wildfires, they began setting small fires in the understory to regenerate areas that had become decadent 
overgrown and unproductive. Fire was medicine for the land. When prescribed at the right time, in the right amount, and at the right intervals, the Washoe were able to create and renew habitat for prey and for edible and useful plants. Most importantly, with this practice, megafires were minimized. We know from tree ring studies of old growth stumps at University of California Berkeley's Sage Hen Creek Field Station that low intensity fires were on the land every two to seven years, far exceeding average lightning strike intervals for the region. This means most of the low intensity fires were set by the Washoe. In fact, the same study revealed that catastrophic fires only happened every three to 400 years, so rare that the Washoe considered them a punishment for neglecting their kin. This warning is echoed in Judith Lowry's Dao Lululek. Judith, whose heritage is of Hamawe and Atsugwe bands of the Pit River tribe and the Noyataku band of the Mountain Maidu tribe, painted this piece in response to the Angora fire. She witnessed the devastation it wrecked on South Lake Tahoe, and it brought to mind her great-grandparents' warnings of Dao Lululek, fire demons who would immolate unwary children that wandered into the forest. Using fire to care for the land resulted in two big things. Collectively, the tribes from California and Oregon created the vast array of flora and fauna that make up the California Floristic Province, one of the world's 14 biodiversity hotspots, rivaling the Amazon basin in its number of endemic species. In addition, human intervention with fire on the land produced the fire-adapted forest ecology we still have today. This ecology needs regular interval, low-intensity fire to thrive. To represent the legacy of the Washoe people and the near demise of themselves and their legacy, paper cut artist Tahiti Pearson collaborated with the tribe, who provided one of their three creation stories to be cut out of a facsimile of Alfred Bierstadt's Sunrise Over Donner Lake. Bierstadt's painting was originally commissioned by the Transcontinental Railroad as a travel poster to draw tourists to the region. What viewers then and now don't realize is what gave this landscape its great beauty and value were the customs of culture that was removed from the land. Tahiti cut out the Washoe's creation story and left the cuttings to represent their removal abrupt and murderous. The cutout spaces represent the people and legacy that survives and endures, speaking through the land. The mylar backing the cutout letters allow us to glimpse ourselves in the artwork and imagine our own responsibilities to great grandkin. Chapter 2 170 years ago, with the discovery of gold and silver, cultural influence over the forest changed abruptly from a culture that valued the forest floor and cared for it with fire to a culture that valued the large trees and suppressed all fire. Looking up, we see that there are no trees from the Sierra Succession sculpture above us, referencing the clear cutting of the entire region on behalf of extractive industry. Nancy Mintz, who creates organic forms out of geometric shapes, chose to represent the transition from a kin-centric landscape to an industrialized landscape with the sculpture Cathedral, transforming an old growth stump into an irregular metal lattice representing railroad and mine structures. The discovery of silver in Virginia City, Nevada, part of the foundational wealth of the West's modern industrial landscape, nearly destroyed the Washoe people, devastating their way of life and their forest kin. Sandow Burke's acrylic on canvas painting 
The Rape of the Sierra, depicts the fate of the entire old growth forest of the Tahoe Basin, from clear cutting to installation as timbers supporting the mines of the Comstock Lode or the railroads that supplied it. Half of the old growth forest of the Tahoe Basin still exists today, entombed underground. A small fraction of it may be visited on a tour of the Best and Belcher Mine in Virginia City. The old growth forest north of the Tahoe Basin through Truckee and up the Sage Hen Creek watershed is also completely gone, clear cut and processed at Hobart Mills into fruit boxes, window frames, and firewood from the years 1880 to 1900. The same 20 years that the Tahoe Basin was clear cut was a very wet period. The denuded land exploded with native grasses, making ranching of domestic livestock viable. The action of their grazing and hooves on the topsoil caused soil erosion, which washed into streams, interrupting spawning cycles of native fish. During this same period, commercial fishing devastated Lake Tahoe's native trout population. These large-scale disturbances on the landscape caused catastrophic ecological degradation and native species loss. Tiffany Bozick, who renders both life and death with equal beauty in honor of the full ecological cycle, painted Fading Song in watered acrylic on maple panel. It depicts an innocent lamb resting on an old growth stump above many of the native Sierra Nevada species that are lost entirely or endangered by extractive land management and fire suppression policies. The accompanying species key enables us to understand what we have lost, as well as the biodiversity that we will safeguard with better understanding of how to care for the land. Once the Forest Service became very good at fire suppression, people began to move into the Sierra Nevada because it was inexpensive beautiful and afforded solitude. The infrastructure required to support people like roads, water, and sewage systems disrupt forest biomes, further weakening them. These areas of disruption are called the wildland urban interface, the WUI. Recently, more and more people are moving into the WUI just as fuel loads have become extremely dangerous. Erica Osborne's Oil on Linen Painting on the Edge of the Sublime depicts the dangers of living in the Wui without understanding how to comprehensively care for forest systems. The Party Crashers of Paradise is poet Indigo Moore's homage to nature and the destructive power of the catastrophic campfire which destroyed the town of Paradise, California in 2018. In looking at Nina Elder's Tangled Systemic Suppression, can you tell what it is about? Nina drew it with chainsaw grease and wildfire charcoal, speaking to both the consequences of fire suppression and the path to forest resiliency lying beneath the forest floor. Comprehensive care of forest systems begins in the soil. Most people don't realize there is just as much biomass below the surface of the forest as there is above it. Beneath our feet lies the symbiotic relationship between trees and mycorrhizal fungi, which is at the heart of forest health and resiliency. Resilient forests can recover from disturbance and partner with us in the needed carbon drawdown. In accepting that 100% fire suppression is bad for forest health, we then must consider smoke, which is bad for human health. Sarah Coleman paints atmospheres. Her piece, Reverence, which is painted with ink and spray paint on tinted mirror, addresses the incompatibility of the year-round expectation of crystal clear skies with healthy forest systems. It encourages us to consider 
what kind of smoke we invite into our lives. Smoke policy is one of two areas affecting forest health that is of common concern to all people. Water is the other. The watersheds of the Sierra Nevada provide 60% of the water for 40 million people. Using U.S. Geological Survey maps as a reference, Todd Gillins drew the Tuolumne and Mokolumne River watersheds to reveal the direct connection between a resilient forest biome and the well-being of every Californian. Silkscreened in ink and silver leaf onto Fabriano Rasapina paper, these prints follow the water cascading down through the forest watersheds to reservoirs like Hetch Hetchy and Lake Eleanor, and from there onto San Francisco through pipelines, or to the San Joaquin Valley's vast agricultural farmlands via irrigation ditches. They clearly illuminate the collective responsibility of all Californians to invest in the health of the Sierra Nevada forests, which protect those indispensable watersheds. Many threads have been pulled from the ecological patterns that hold together the Sierra Nevada forest. The first step in repairing the weave begins with plotting out restoration sites and taking an inventory of forest species and topography within those sites using digital mapping technology. From the data set collected, foresters understand which tree species and how many smaller trees and shrubs should be removed to reduce both fuel loads and water competition and to renew and support beneficial species. Artist Jory Emery creates weavings in relationship to place. Her, her Sierra LiDAR weaving repositions elements of digital mapping technology into the analog making of textile using painted cotton and data sets collected from Sierra restoration projects. Once species inventory is completed, a restoration plan is in place, and permits are secured. The second step of forest restoration begins with crews on the ground, implementing both mechanically and by hand. Thousands of small trees and shrubs are cut and removed to lumber mills or left on the ground in piles for later burning. The sculpture blades was created from castings of the blades of the main tools of tree removal, chainsaws and feller buncher tractors. It alludes to the great demand for the skilled labor required to restore 25 million acres of forest. In 2021, it was estimated that this process would take at least 15 years with ongoing maintenance in the years after. Fire is the final step and the most traditional in forest restoration. Once scientists understood the ecology of a fire-adapted forest, it quickly became obvious that low-intensity fire is not only the most efficient way to maintain forest health, but also the most economical. The traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous people using small fires to renew the landscape suddenly made sense. For now, restoration crews are using low-intensity prescribed burns to reduce fuel loads. As the overall fuel loads in the forest reduce, we can become more sophisticated in our choices, akin to indigenous cultural burning, which renews the forest biome, as well as our relationship with it. Beating artist Jessa Ray Growing Thunder of the Dakota and Nakota from the Buffalo Nation was raised on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada. Seeing hope in cultural cooperation on behalf of the land, she beaded the tools of prescribed burning, helmet, McClellan rake, and drip torch, with the symbols of her people for fire, water, earth, and air coming together in harmony. Although government, forest stakeholders, scientists, and the public 
are all agreed on the need to eliminate catastrophic fire, there are significant hurdles to implementing forest restoration at a large scale. Namely, we lack a trained workforce and the infrastructure to process and utilize millions of small trees. California's timber industry essentially died in the 1990s with the advent of NAFTA, when Canadian timber became less expensive to buy locally than Californian timber. The mills closed and the skilled labor departed. In addition, most of the remaining mills are tooled to process large trees, not small ones. Nevertheless, the tremendous amount of wood coming out of the forest is driving innovation in the wood products industry. Mass timber for construction, biogeneration power plants, wood fiber insulation, and biochar as a soil supplement in agriculture are all examples of how small trees can be utilized. In creating these products, the small tree industries permanently sink the carbon the trees would otherwise release into the air during a catastrophic fire. Biochar in particular also greatly reduces methane offgassing when added to manure piles and is a productive soil supplement, reducing the need for nitrogen fertilizer, potentially creating a deeply beneficial relationship between California's mountain forests and valley farms. Elizabeth Gutmann's Subterranean, whose horizontal lines are created from charred wood, represents the dawn of innovation and a hopeful future springing from restoring our forests. As restoration is implemented up and down the Sierra Nevada, catastrophic fires will recede. The forest will return to balance with fire. The soil will renew and sunlight will penetrate to the forest floor, greatly increasing habitat and food for forest species. Biodiversity will rise. Artist Andy Thrams spends weeks at a time working at remote residencies in the forest. Wander Wonder, made from pigment and mica on rag paper, is an exploration of forest biodiversity and biophilia. In it, she shares her reverence for wildness and her hopes for a restored and resilient forest. Artist and experimental philosopher Jonathan Keats observes that nature is our caretaker, but wonders in this time of climate change and mass extinction, who will heal nature? Most of us are not skilled in restoration practices, but do we have to be? It is well documented that placebos help heal patients. It is not the material of the placebo that actually heals. It is the act of caring that does. To help initiate our first step in caring for nature, Jonathan offers placebos for ecosystems, small pebbles to plant in our local biome. Go ahead, plant some. The Forest Fire Project was created under an umbrella partnership. Truckee Donner Recreation and Park District made it possible to apply for seed funding and loaned us the beautiful public art wing of their Truckee Community Recreation Center. Nevada County Arts Council was instrumental in procuring seed and other funding and assisted with promotion. University of California Berkeley's Sage Hen Creek Field Station invited us into their artists in residency program, connected us with their scientists, and introduced us to our cultural advisors, the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Educational and environmental outreach was developed and implemented by Sierra Watershed Education Partnerships, California Arts Council, California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation through their Nature and Queen of Hearts Funds, Tahoe Truckee Excellence in Education Foundation, University of Nevada, Reno, California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, Tahoe Truckee Airport District, and many, many more from the community. Thank you. Heather and Michael, thank you so much for the generous tour of Forest Fire. It was amazing. And thank you to all the artists that participated. And I know you put a lot into this project. We're delighted to have it as part of Nevada Neighbors. 
the Nevada Neighbor Series uh, used to be in person, but after COVID arrived, we made it an online program. So it's available to those of you that want to watch at any time. Uh, you can follow, follow us on our website, ccainv.org, and see all of our current exhibitions and the archive on the previous ones. Um, CCAI's generous funders are listed on the following slide. And thank you for watching.